coming up on Theatre Talk. I've, I've said to a lot of people, they've said, what's the difference between being here with this play and being in the History Boys? And I'm saying, well, I'm seeing New York in the daytime, <laughs> which I didn't really see last time. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. Two jobs? How did that happen? Oh, you, you got to concentrate, ain't ya? With two jobs? I mean, I, I can do it, as long as I don't get confused. But I do get confused easily. But I, I don't get confused that easily. Yes, I do. I'm my own worst enemy. Stop being negative. I'm not being negative. I'm being realistic. I'll screw it up, I always do. Who screws it up? You! You're the role model for village idiots everywhere. Me? You're nothing without me. You're the cock up. Don't you call me a cock up, you cock up. <laughs> From New York City, this is Theatre Talk. I'm producer Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. So, Michael, I saw one man, two goes. Here's and you've got, she's got the evidence to prove it because she was laughing so hard, she completely smeared the playbill of one man. All two over goes, my face. All <laughs> over her face. This is, uh, I would have to say, the funniest play I have seen on Broadway since the original production of Noises Off that I saw as a kid. A terrific play from the great National Theater of, of uh, Great Britain. Just opened on Broadway. It was written by Richard Bean. Welcome to Theater Talk. Hello. It was directed by our old friend Nick Heitner, who runs brilliantly the National Theatre. Welcome back to Theatre Talk. To and it stars uh, the man who is, I think now we can call him the king or the prince or the great star of Broadway. A breakout <laughs> performance this season, James Gordon. Well, James Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I would screw it up. So, he's so yes. big. <laughs> That's right. It's his name wrong. It's so, everybody's talking about that guy. That iconic. His name, we can't quite say. <laughs> James Corden, for That's the right. record. Terrific performance. <laughs> Thank you very um, much. All right, Nick and Richard, what, what, whose idea was it to take an old Goldoni play, a uh, Venetian play from the 18th century, I believe, The Servant of Two Masters, and rewrite it and update it to England in the early 60s? Is this something, as a producer, you thought, that's a good idea, I'll do this? This, yeah, this started with what was looking like a really grim season at the National Theatre. <laughs> <laughs> wall, to, wall to wall serious. <laughs> and uh, in a, one of our planning meetings, uh, I declared, as I sometimes do unilaterally, we need funny. Uh, they generally look straight back at me when I'm saying we need funny. Uh, the idea came up of Servant of Two Masters, which is a play I know well because as a school kid, I played his part. Um, I was um, not as good. <laughs> <laughs> but you did the original, you did the real Goldoni. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah. we did the Goldoni. Yeah. And I'd been trying to find something to bring James back. Uh, who, James hadn't been on stage since the History Boys. Right, for a while. wonderful performance in the History Boys. Yeah. So I called Richard with this play, with this actor, and a vague notion, a, a notion certainly that I didn't want to do the Italian Harlequin number, mm. a vague notion that there was something uh, between uh, the Italian tradition and the English tradition that we could exploit, that we could, that we could um, celebrate all those great English low comic traditions. And Brighton 50s, 60s mm. was where I was sniffing around. Mm. And then we, and the conversation started from there. Did you know the Goldoni play when he... No, I didn't, no, no. I, um, we commissioned a literal translation because I wanted to work from a literal. Mm -hmm. There's many, many versions of this play um, done by some terrific playwrights and I tried to avoid all of those so we've got a literal which if you've ever read a literal <laughs> uh, it was like you know it's really tough reading isn't it so no I didn't know the play um, and uh, I could see that I could see how the plot might work and I could see how the plot might work for 60s Brighton mm -hmm. um, so yeah I was on board and I was quite happy yeah. mm. and James you did you know the play at all when I, I didn't I didn't I knew of it and I only knew of it because it had been one of those things that, that various people kind of along the way of my career kind of since the history boys had said oh That's you know cool. what would be a good part for you would be truffle dino in a servant to two masters and that was all i really knew of it and uh and nick called and said uh 
would you like to come and do a play next year at the National Theatre? And I said, are you going to direct it? And Nick said, I, I will direct it if you do it. And I said, then I'll do it. And Nick said, do you not want to know what it is? And I said, I don't really mind. I said, uh, because I think... What happens if he had said it would be a four-hour Ibsen without us? <laughs> then I'd jokes? be in, because the truth <laughs> is, I really would. I, I, you know, the, because I think that the, the reason I think you say... Is, firstly, you know, if you're an actor working in Britain, you don't really say no to the National Theatre. And I think even more so, the eight of us boys who are in the History Boys have a, um, like an emotional pull towards the National Theatre and a romantic attachment to working with Nick. It was such an experience that changed our lives that that when that call comes again, you know that, that you're just going to learn and you will come out of that building a better actor. And that's whether you walk in when you're 25, like I did, or whether you walk in when you're 40, however good you are, you'll come out of that building a better actor. And certainly if you're working with Nick and certainly if the script's written by Richard Bean. So it was a real no-brainer for me. It, it didn't even cross my mind. So I didn't really know the original. I read it. Um, but Nick had kind of said, don't focus too much on that because we're going to do something completely fresh with it. I'm know. interested in something you touched on because American audiences, I don't think, know too much about this. And you guys can tell us about this um, low comedy of, of, of England at the time, the music hall comedy, those kind of comedians. Tell us what that world was, was like and, and, and why you're attracted to it. Initially, because it was where I kind of came in. It, 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 when I was a kid, growing up in the north of England in the 60s, mm -hmm. uh, the, the guys who used to uh, tour the variety circuit were still there. So you see all these um, old popular comedians, double acts, specialty acts mm. with this ridiculous shtick. Yeah, yeah. And, and you had a great attachment to that kind of stuff. Because you're, com you're, you're a comedian, right? I did, well, yeah, I did stand up for six years, uh, but that was in the kind of alternative comedy wave, which started about in the mid eighties in England mm -hmm. anyway, um, following on kind of piggybacking on from Richard Pryor and whatever ever over here. But I think that's, that's less important. Actually, it's less, it's really not that influential on this play. The real influence, I mean, Nick and I are much the same age. So we grew up with watching, uh, you know, Norman Wisdom, uh, George Formby, uh, Oracle all the, Wise, the yeah, one. yeah, yeah, all, all of that. Kind Tommy of Cooper, tradition. the wonderful yeah. Tommy yeah. Cooper. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's in our blood, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And where, James, you fit into this, when I was watching your performance and thinking, you know, he really is almost an authentic in that era of those kind of comedians. And you reminded me very much of Nathan Lane when wow. he was in something like The Producers or The Odd Couple as being really the, the last actor we have who's in touch with those great old Broadway character actors of the Neil Simon era of the 50s and, and, and the 60s. All of those people, you know, Nathan Lane, when, when Nathan Lane came to London and, and did like Max Bialystok with the producers, I saw it six times. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, and for a couple of those performances, I, I, would just, I would just watch him, you know, and just think, oh my God, I can't, I can't imagine what that must feel like to, to just almost conduct us as an audience as to quite when we should laugh and when we should carry on. And, <laughs> and with the tiniest look, the tiniest eye, the, like a pause and a beat, and it was like, you, 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 you know, and, and that's the kind of the great nights when we're doing this play, that the really great nights are those nights where you're not entirely sure where the audience finishes mm. and the play begins and vice versa. And it goes in one sort of loop of fun where who's, it's hard to say who's having the most fun, like me or the audience some nights. And I, it's almost always me. There is, not to give anything away, but there is interaction with the audience. At what stage did you decide to put that? Well, I'd, I'd written the first half, um, and we workshopped the first half before I started writing the second half. And during the workshop, which we were talking about this the other day, weren't we, Nick? This, mm -hmm. The way that, how useful the workshop was, because uh, the dinner scene, which um, is the climax of the first half, we couldn't get it to work in the workshop, because we're just sitting around a table reading scripts. There's nothing physical going on. And I hadn't really written the physical. Uh, what they call Latsy in the in the original Commedia, the kind of set piece uh, physical gags, and we had a fantastic discussion around the table. Actors who were just reading the script um, about what was possible in the form, if you like, 
of this play. And I think it was that workshop which allowed me to extend the form. And as you say, without giving too much away, yeah. the form of the play was extended. Uh, and I think I'd put it down to that first workshop, really. Mm. I'm curious, Nick, when you're directing a farce like this, and you also directed um, brilliantly um, the Dion Boussico play. London Assurance, which, which had a great <laughs> deal more of Richard Bean than... Oh, that's right, you adapted I forgot ...than anybody that. realized. Uh, textual revisions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that was, that was uh, uh, as funny as One Man, Two Gods. Well, I I'll tell it. you how that worked. Yeah. I went through the Victorian script yeah. with a, a yellow marker pen, uh, marking everything which I thought was supposed to be funny that wa and wasn't. And, and his job was to rewrite them so that they were funny again. Uh, <laughs> and that's what he did. So two thirds of the last were yours. Oh, that's so yeah. generous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> James, you weren't in that one, but you can play that part too. Yeah. I wasn't, be, but he'll I be able to play the that's puppets. Uh, yeah, it's it. in your, it'll, it's 30 it's years future. time, you yeah. can good play. If you can give us a little sort of mini masterclass in directing, how does one approach a farce? This one? Eddie, this one, I st this one particularly, yeah. st I started off by bringing in another director, Cal McChrystal, <laughs> whose, pa who, whose particular expertise is physical comedy. Uh -huh. And Cal worked on all the physical stuff. The Lazzi. Um, uh, the Lazzi uh, are old. You, you, the, there's nothing new under the sun. The stuff with the trunk, the stuff with the letter, the stuff with the food. This is all old mid 18th century Italian shtick, mm. which obviously has its equivalent in in mid 20th century English shtick. It has, it has, it, Lazzi means shtick, that's what it means. Mm. For instance, James's fight with himself, James worked out with, uh, uh, with Karma Crystal. Otherwise, it's, it's a kind of um, almost uh, indescribable, undescribable mix of granting freedom and being utterly disciplined. One of the problems is that very quickly in rehearsal, it stops being funny. Mm. Uh, and I remember during rehearsal, there were ensemble members, understudies in rehearsal, who very supportively were laughing at everything indiscriminately. It's what actors do when they're in rehearsal. They laugh at each other because they're kind of fond of each other. And the writer was yeah. laughing as well. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things, one of the things I did was, was, was ban laughter in rehearsal, quite literally. I'll decide what's funny. I'm really not interested in hearing your laughter anymore. You're laughing at stuff that's funny and unfunny indiscriminately, shut up. So it's, uh, but it's, uh, you have to hold your nerve you have to have a real sense of um, the way you're manipulating time. Mm. Um, and when you're working with someone like James, you, you kind of decide um, what's going to be what it is yep. all the time and where you get to go off piece, don't you? Yeah, well, there's these really odd moments because there are, there are moments in, in, in the show which you really can't rehearse particularly because they are completely unique to that night and that night alone so in those moments we would just go and then it'll be something like this <laughs> and then we'll just carry on <laughs> michael and i saw different performances and so we compared notes well did this happen when you saw it or did it, you know is mm -hmm. this staged or is this not and and there were things that happened that weren't planned clearly and you were just so relaxed i think i've always felt quite relaxed because i feel i feel incredibly uh I feel incredibly comfortable in the character. I feel really, really comfortable, and I really, it's so brilliantly written that those, that, that there's that kind of blurred line as to where, when, it, when is it me talking and when is it the character talking, and the truth is, it, it, it's rarely ever me, it's just a different part of that character, I think, and so, so once you're in that mindset, and, and you and might make a plea to the audience for something, and then, and then, completely out of the blue something would happen you uh you just have to go along with it also i i mean i i feel incredibly lucky to be able to to do a play you know i think we've we've done it 250 odd times now and i've never done the same show twice never once and 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 i'm 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 well aware of what a luxury that is to be here on broadway Having a, having a unique experience every night because the hardest bit of this job is after the opening when it's all exciting is when you really get down to the grind of doing doing it eight times a week and keeping that fresh. Yeah, I'm going to come by in August to see how you're holding up. But you know what? It, well, well, but it will still have. There will still yeah. be. Yeah. When you come in August, 
it will still be unique to that night because it is never ever the same. And you find you find stuff every now and then which you then kind of incorporate. From yeah, on, yeah. The, the new bits come, new lines happen, yeah. or Richard yeah. will send an email and go, I've had a new idea for this. What do you think about this? And you go, oh, that's good. I'll try it tonight. And then I'll send one back and go, oh, it absolutely yeah. killed. I then did this. And, you know, it just, my the biggest thing I have to do is watch is time. I have to really yeah. be aware yeah. that this <laughs> yeah. show does it go really over 11 o'clock or you're going to yeah. cost the national well, really a lot of money in really, union costs? Well, it, not even 11 o'clock. It can't go past 10.30 <laughs> is the truth. It really can't. And so I have to be uh, aware, and this is the lesson that we've learned really in London, is Nick saying you, you've got to pace the audience as much as you pace yourself because there's a whole second act to this play yeah. and the play has to go like this. And what we want is everybody having a great time at the end. Right, right. And so that's a lesson that you just learn by doing it. Do you remember your first preview? Did everything work like clockwork? Well, or do you go, we, oh my God, we have to sort things out? Uh, in the rehearsal room, Nick, um, for the l before we went into the tech week, Nick had um, invited two schools in. There was about 80 the first, uh, first uh, rehearsal. Uh, so this was 80, 16-year-olds. And we were nervous, weren't we? We didn't quite know whether it would work. And it w wasn't a bad show, but with the, the following day, there was 100. And they went nuts. Um, uh, there was an interesting difference between those two runs. Yeah. So we had two rehearsal room runs with teenagers in. Mm. Uh, the first one, it was okay, it was a little depressing. <laughs> and I think we worked out it was because they, they were a little confused about who was taking them through the show. Now, James has a, um, a, a, a big profile uh, yeah. in England. Yeah. And I think they weren't clear enough that it was this kind of um, innocent, this, this bumbling innocent um, who's cunning but kind of stupid and, and not sharp, no hard contemporary edge. They weren't clear enough it was that person. They thought it might be... His personality as James the, Corden. Though. The thing they know as James. So we took an element of sharpness, an element of contemporary edge away, and then it worked much better. Right. And, of course, you don't have that problem over here because no one knows who you are. <laughs> That's right. No, I mean, seriously, that, yes. it's been, it's been <laughs> yeah. kind of the greatest, the, greatest, the greatest thing about opening here. I mean, I, I felt absolutely as nervous, probably more nervous, I think, our first preview here than our first preview at home because... Because I, I was aware that, for, that, that whenever we'd done it in London, there had always been a section, an element of the audience that I already had an existing relationship with, who perhaps might have come because I was in the play. And, and I knew that that absolutely wasn't the case here. And I suddenly worried, oh, my God, what if this all just is awful and they hate, you know, at me and everything. And, and, and so getting this great reaction, which has been absolutely bigger and warmer than it ever was in London, a bigger response to every joke, every laugh, uh, has been the most incredible every, feeling every, ever. Every uh, British actor and, and director and writer always tell, they always say that um, the best audiences are the New York audiences. They laugh louder than the British audiences. They seem just more enthusiastic about being in the theater. Do you find, uh, this your, is this your first Broadway show? Uh, yeah, first Broadway, yeah. yeah. Um, I've had off off. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> it looks like it might have been a painful moment in your career there. No, it was fine. It was, uh, it was really sweet. I, I agree with that, yeah. I think, I think some of the, I don't know quite how to describe the jokes. I mean, I think of a lot of the script as, the, there's the big woofers, London get it, New York get it, and then some of those middling jokes. The Americans are getting them more than the English. Absolutely. I think what's great here is there's this, it's just like it feels like just a wave of, 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 of pleasure coming back from, from the audience and you feel it from the first scene to the last and, and it's... Um, I, think there's an, I think there's always been a five minute section at the beginning of the play, the first five minutes. Definitely, yeah. Where you feel the audience going, what? What? Yeah. This? Yes, that's true. You're kidding, mm -hmm. this? And it takes a while to realize there is no substance. It has nothing to say <laughs> about the human condition. It is completely unsophisticated. It's old fashioned, low comedy, but kind of low comedy with a really, really ancient pedigree. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's yeah. what the Greeks used to play yeah. uh, in rap with the high tragedy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and when the audience tune into its innocence, right. uh, 
I think there's a kind of letting go of all the of all the expectation of sophistication, which is a, which is re I hope a release in the way comedy should be a release. I think that's a testament actually just to your face because the moment you walk on stage, that innocence is comes comes in with him. I try to bring it wherever I go. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but since you are a babe in the... Well, you're not really a babe in the woods on Broadway because you had success on um, with the History Boys. But you are now what we would call a Broadway star. You were uh, emerging as a Broadway star. I saw you feted by Anna Wintour. All these awards are coming up. I'm sure you'll be part of the mix. Um, it's going to go to your head sooner or later, right? <laughs> I, I would hope not. It's... it's uh, <laughs> It's, it's, it's overwhelming is the truth, it really is. Sometimes it's, because, you know, I've been so fortunate. Since, since, since we finished with the History Boys and I went home and, and I wrote a TV show and it did, it did very, very well at home and, and, and so many things have happened to me, but it's always, to be honest, it's, it's all felt like a quest to try and come back and work in New York again. Such was, is my enjoyment and love of, of it as a city and particularly as a theatre community like to, to work here it's it's the most brilliant place and so like just to be sat here now on this show talking to you and you saying this for me is it's it, it's, it's a little too much to comprehend because <laughs> it's it's it really is everything I ever dreamt of like genuinely and for my parents to come out and watch the show the other day and you know, for it to, to have my name above the thing and come on and these big cheers and stuff. It's uh, it's the most, I, I will never ever forget this time. It is just, it's, it's a magical moment for me and I, I just want to try and enjoy every single second of it. Now know? since you're uh, uh, carrying this play in many ways, have you had to cut back on the um the infamous carousing that the History Boys did when they were here in New York. I remember some wild nights at uh, Angus McIntosh with I, all, all of you guys. I well, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a married man now. So <laughs> I, I'm, and a father. I'm using a lot less condoms than I was <laughs> <laughs> the previous time. Not just me, but there would always be one of the boys who needed one. So it would always, but at least we were being safe, you know? Uh, no, I mean, that, that it was, you know, I've, I've said to a lot of people, they've said, what's the difference between being here with this play and being in the History Boys? And I'm saying, well, I'm seeing New York in the daytime, <laughs> which I didn't really see last time. I would, I would really just, we would sleep all day right. at various parts of the city and then come in to do, there is no greater city if you're young, single, in a hit, and you finish work at 10.30. It is a magical place to work. <laughs> It's very different now. I have a one-year-old son and a wife, and it's and it's lovely. And I'm I'm incredibly grateful because I don't think I could do it again. I don't think my body could take it. You got to be a little bit disciplined, I think, to pull off uh, to pull off this one. It's a good thing that I'm a lot more settled now because I really, the two are mutually exclusive. Going out and doing this play, so it's um you know it's and it, and it, and, it, and I really have to you know it's my it's my main focus to to try and make every night as good as last night, you right. know, because we're, we're, you know, there's, there's pressure now yeah. with all these incredible reviews. And I tried to say that to a couple of the cast, you know, the other day, there's, there's, I was like, now people are sitting down going, show us. Well, this is, this is the hilarious thing. And we, if we don't, no one wants to be the play that, that the critics said was good, but they didn't really enjoy it. You know, you want to be the thing that people go, like the History Boys was, you know, there's a, you know, as well as anyone, there's, there's, that you can be a hit in New York and you can be a real hit in New York. And, and we, we possibly have a chance of doing that. And, and, and that's up to us now, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. once these guys go home. Yeah. <laughs> but you have to come back to keep tabs on them, right? Because can't the actors sort of in a farce get a little out of control, having a little too much fun? Yeah, they can. <laughs> <laughs> Every now and then it's a good idea to, uh, to come and, uh, and remind them what they've added since you saw it last time. D having said that, d my favourite bits are very often the bits I've never seen before mm. in this show. Mm. Mm. Well, well, you know the great uh, George Kaufman story, he, he wrote a play that the Marx Brothers were in. And after about uh, you know, a month on Broadway, he went to see the play. <laughs> And he said, shh, quiet, I, I think I heard one of my lines. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to be there, Richard, when you yeah. say, what the guy is this guy doing with my script? Yeah. No, I've, I've got a way of measuring this when I'm not, I mean, obviously I haven't, I, you know, haven't, don't see every show and it's been on tour and whatever, but I, do, I read, um, we've got a show report every night, as you can imagine, and I don't read them, uh, but I look at the timing of the first half. That's all I look at. 
and I can tell everything that's happened <laughs> from the timing of the first half. And it should be one hour 16 or something like that. You, you get some show reports, one hour 35. <laughs> <laughs> the play is One Man, Two Governors, uh, absolutely uh, brilliantly funny comedy at the Music Box Theatre, written by Richard Bean, directed by Nick Heitner, and starring James Corden. See, it only took half an hour. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you for, very much for being our guest tonight at Theatre Talk. Good luck. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you. A friend of mine likes you. <laughs> What's his name? Paddy. <laughs> What's he look like? Oh, he could be a movie star. Godzilla? <laughs> nah. He's a good looking lad. He's big boned. And how did he get big bones? Oh, the usual nature, nurture. Partly genetic, partly pies. <laughs> <laughs> he likes his food, yeah. Does he prefer eating or making love? <laughs> it's a tough one, that, isn't it? I don't know. You can sign up for viewer updates at theatertalk.org. Or you can Twitter us. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>